So what do we know already about the brain? Well, we know, we understand about um, regions and structures and functions and all of that. But now we want to turn our attention to the processing centers within the cerebrum. Most conscious action is performed through the cerebrum. Okay, um, let me just take you again through the entire um, central nervous system and let's look at it in a little more detail now in terms of what's going on where. Um, it might help with the lights here too. If somebody, Leslie, could you just hit the switch closest to the door? Yeah, that one, that's good. Okay. So we know that most processing that occurs in the nervous system is occurring in the central nervous system. Okay? This central nervous system has specific processing centers for any number of things that are going on within the human body. Now, where does it get its information for processing? Well, it gets it through the peripheral nervous system. Peripheral nervous system, part of the peripheral nervous system is bringing input into the central nervous system. Okay? This kind of data is what we call sensory data. Right? Sensory information is coming in through elements of the peripheral nervous system and that's being processed in specific areas here in the central nervous system. This is what we've seen is what one of those sensory neurons looks like. Remember, this is one that doesn't necessarily have dendrites. It's just a long axon with a cell body to keep that axon alive. And that axon is just bringing the raw data in. It's not trying to process it out here in the peripheral nervous system. It's just bringing it straight into the central nervous system. And there are sections of the central nervous system that are focused on interpreting what does that data mean. What does the data from my eyes mean? What does the data from my ears mean? What does the data from my skin, what does it all mean? And so there's specific processing centers in the central nervous system for this. Likewise, there are gonna be specific centers in the central nervous system um, for output, okay? so. The peripheral nervous system is going to conduct messages out to the muscles of my human body to cause actions that are part of being a human being. And all of this peripheral nerve output is going to come from specific motor centers in the central nervous system. So within the central nervous system, I'm going to have specific sites that are dedicated to motor activities. Now these, these sort of elements of sensory and motor are just generally, we're gonna look specifically where they're at. They're not meant to be where they are in this diagram. The diagram here is just representing the central nervous system in general. The motor actions here are then being communicated out into the body through peripheral nerves, okay? So I've got motor output here. And those neurons look more like this, right? And they're not really located out here. When you see them in the context of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, it's like this, okay? So the cell bodies are here in the central nervous system. This is where we figure out what we're gonna do, the motor activities. And then the peripheral nervous system is generally the axons from these neurons going out to the muscles or the structures of the body. So I'm gonna have specific sensory and motor areas within that central nervous system that are communicating into and out of the central nervous system. And so out of the peripheral nervous system, about 99% of what you see out in the peripheral nervous system is just axons, isn't it? Right? And the majority of what gets processed is being processed within the central nervous system. When somebody says nerves, 
When you see nerves in the human body, you've certainly seen them in the cat. Those nerves are just bundles of axons carrying signals into and out of the central nervous system. Now, what else in the central nervous system? Well, all the other sorts of processing things that are going on, all of your thinking processes are going on in the central nervous system. Your memory is here, right? All those other activities that you associate with being a human being, feeling things and thinking things and deciding things and remembering things, and all of that is here in the central nervous system. So we know that there are these places, but where are they? Okay? Well, the cerebrum is remarkably uniform, isn't it? When you look at the cerebrum, you see fissures, and you see gyri, and you see sulci, but there's no sense that, oh, this is sensory, or this is motor, or this is where I think, or this is where I understand, or this is where I see something. You just can't tell by looking at the cerebrum what's what. <coughs> so, it, we know that the cerebrum is divided into low, but where do these distinct activities take place? Where do these distinct activities that, um, like sensory pro actions and motor actions, where do they take place, and how do we know? Well, we've done enough study that we know that there are functional areas, okay? They have been located, okay, within the cerebrum. How do we know where these things are? How, you certainly can't tell where all these things are by just looking at the cerebrum. How do we know? How do we know where the sensory areas are? How do we know where the motor areas are? Can you think? How might we know that, oh, certain activities take place at certain places? Well, the brain doesn't do any moving. Yeah, but how do, how do I know? I, it's, it's inside my cranium. How do I know what's going on in there? Okay. Today we have lots of MRIs and we have lots of imaging techniques, don't we? But that hasn't always been true. 50 years ago, how did we know where certain areas were in the brain? That's a certain, she said, poking certain areas in the brain. You can't do that commonly, but... It's generally true that when we're doing brain surgery that our patient is awake. Okay, the brain cannot feel anything itself. Right, feeling takes place through sensory nerves that are processing that data. The brain is only processing. It doesn't feel anything. A simple local anesthetic to the scalp to deaden the feeling in your skin here and you can cut through the skull, and there's the brain. And typically we do want the patient awake because sometimes we have to kind of find out exactly where we want to be, and some of that is just using a weak electric current sort of tickling some of the neurons on the surface of the brain. And the patient tells us, well, I see that, or I feel that, or I think that. And so by tickling certain areas over the surface of the brain, we've kind of generally found out, oh, these kinds of things are typically in this area, these kinds of things are typically in that area. Another big one is somebody has a stroke, let's say, and they, use the, they lose the use of their arm, maybe. So after that person dies, we do an autopsy, we look at the brain, and we see the lack of blood flow caused a whole section of cells in one certain area to die. We can see it looks like a Grand Canyon on the surface of the brain, like like. Some of these gyri, there's just a deep hole here, and some of these gyri and sulci are just missing. They've just degenerated due to that stroke. Well, now we begin to say, okay, that area, if they lost the use of their arm, that area must be part of the area that makes your arm work. And so little by little over time, 
you know, through either autopsies, right, or through all these imaging, you know, through today's imaging techniques, all of these various things that have been done over time, okay, we've been able to figure out where all these different areas are. And we still don't know all of it by any means. But we have some very distinct things that we know. This picture that you're looking at here <coughs> is in chapter 14, which is kind of interpreting all the functional things that are going on in the brain. And you might want to look at this again. It's in your, your reading list and all. <coughs> but let's look now at this colored view of the brain and begin to get an idea of where certain things are happening. And I think where, where I'd like to have you start is in the frontal lobe, okay? Okay, the frontal lobe, what we know today is that the frontal lobe is involved in movement. Okay, now can you picture the frontal lobe? Can you kind of blank out everything else here? Okay, do this and just kind of blank out the rest. Let's focus on the frontal lobe. And what you'll see here is that there are four areas in the frontal lobe, isn't there? You see four colored places in that frontal lobe, right? There's, there's a location called the primary motor cortex, okay? Or primary motor area. I think in my handout I call it the primary motor area. Area and cortex are totally interchangeable here. Um, this area right here is also, though, a structure of the frontal lobe, isn't it? What structure is this where that primary motor cortex is? You know that structure? This might be on the quiz. Not the central sulcus, because that's the valley here separating the two. I'm pointing to this ridge right here. Pre-central gyrus, right. So a line pointing here can have four different questions, can't it? That line that's on the picture, what if it says, what lobe is this? What's your answer? What's the answer? Come on. Frontal lobe, right. What if this says, what structure is that? Say it out loud. Come on, out loud. Pre-central gyrus. What if it says, what area is this? Primary motor area, right? What if it says, what region is this? Only four answers to a region question. It's the cerebrum, of course. This could be just pointing, you know, it, the line could be pointing and falling on almost anything in here. If it's a region question, it's just what's the region? Cerebrum. Okay? You're going to see these, those words, those distinct focal words there on the quiz. So make sure you're ready for that. This is primary motor cortex. There's three other areas here. There's the premotor area. That's the largest portion of this, that light green area. There's a motor speech area here that's within the confines or within the boundaries of that premotor area. And then way out in front, that sort of gold-colored area there is known as the prefrontal area. So within the frontal lobe, we have found these four major areas. And I, you know, I should say there are more and more that they're defining these days, but these are the four basic ones. You know, you may want to go on and study more and more of the brain. You know, maybe that just happens to be an interest of yours. But we'll start with these four. <coughs> now, what are they? Um, well, this, let's start with this primary motor area. Okay, the primary motor cortex is wired to the muscles of your body. That's what this is all about. Okay, so here's that primary motor cortex, and just imagine that the neurons that are here, the cell bodies of the neurons that are here, have their axons running directly out to the muscles of your body. <coughs> Pardon me. 
Okay, these are, are, you're literally hardwired. Okay, you're born with these neurons wired directly to the muscles of your human body. You remember those, those pyramidal tracks running down the front of the medulla oblongata? Right? Those are the motor tracks. Those are the tracks. Those are the axons coming from these neurons running right down through the brain stem right down through the medulla, down into the spinal cord, and out to the muscles of your body. Now, we know enough about this. We've investigated this enough that we actually know which parts of, which muscles in your body are where. And it's all laid out very interestingly. Look at this picture right here. This is also in chapter 14. This is a frontal section through this precentral gyrus. Okay, can you see that? So here's, here's the lateral fissure down here, right? Lateral fissure, right? And here's up over the surface and right down into the longitudinal fissure. Good? Can you see where we're at? Now, you can see all of the parts of the body, and you can see the words here all drawn to show you which portions, which neurons are devoted to which muscles in the human body. So if I'm going to wiggle my toes, where are the neurons active to do that? Way down here in the longitudinal fissure are the neurons that are connected to the muscles that wiggle my toes. Right? The muscles that move my thumb are over the neurons that move the muscles that move my thumb are way over here. So we've, we've mapped out this whole primary motor cortex and we can see where things are. I think one of the very interesting things here is that when you look at this, you can see that the body is upside down, isn't it? Isn't that interesting? It's, it's maybe got something to do with this cross thing. You know how the right side of my brain controls the left side of my body. So I got... You know, things crossing over to control opposite sides of me. And then at the same time, I've got my whole body printed upside down, or at least wired upside down over my cerebrum. What is that? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows for sure. But I, that's just one of those interesting things. <coughs> the, the person probably looks like they're drawn a little oddly, doesn't it? The shapes and sizes are way off to normal. What the artist did was he drew the features of the human body proportional to the number of neurons associated with it. So you can see you've got probably as many neurons just working your thumb as you have working the whole trunk of your human body. Just think of that. I've got as many neurons working the muscles to work my thumb as I've got to work my entire human body. When, when I look at this, I basically want to think kind of like this, about a third of all of this is dedicated to moving my face, right? About a third of it is dedicated to moving my hand, right? And then the other third is sort of the rest of my human body, isn't it? Right? And that's being very rough, but this shows you how important is it to be able to move your hand and to move your face, What's so important about your face? Communication, right? Communication is so important. It's such an essence of who I am and my ability to interact with you, right? And my hand is my number one tool, isn't it? It's the number one way I interact with my outside world. So I've got a tremendous amount of gray matter, of, of processing power, devoted to moving my face and my hand, and then I've got stuff for the rest of me too. But this is what we know. We know that this primary motor area is wired directly to the human body, to its muscles. Now how about the area right in front of it, what we call the premotor area? The premotor area is the learning part of this movement part of the brain. This is where I learn to do activities. So all of this light green area here is what I call premotor. <coughs> Pardon me. 
So this is like a blank slate when you're born. There's only one thing that you know how to do when you're born. Okay? Breathing is a part of that. Okay? Um, And that's one of those unconscious things. But the conscious things that you do, you're just born with one basic wired skill. No. Okay, your ability to swallow. You have to be able to coordinate the muscles here to swallow. And you're wired to just swallow. Okay, if you can't do that, you can't eat. You'll choke to death. So, you know, the unconscious things like breathing and all of that, yeah, of course, so that's, that's all there. But, you know, to swallow, to just, auto, you know, be able to automatically work everything in there to swallow something down. But otherwise, you don't know how to walk, you don't know how to ride a bike, you don't know how to do any of those things, right? And literally all of these things, all of these various activities that you learn throughout your lifetime, okay? Just think of all of the skills that maybe you've learned over your lifetime, things that people have taught you, things that you've wanted to learn. All of these various activities are localized up here. Okay, and all these things, things as simple as walking, you know, learning how to walk. You don't know how to do that when you're born. You've got areas in here. You've got certain neurons within this premotor area that have become accustomed to performing certain activities. And really what goes on here now, instead of your brain having to seek out the right muscles to work, these neurons have found the right muscles in complex patterns that have become learned skills for you, right? Just, just picture that there is, there's a neuron or a group of neurons here that have sought out and found the right muscles so that instead of me having to seek out muscles every single time I want to do something, I've already learned these patterns. You learn these by repetition, don't you? What you're actually doing is practicing, right, when you try to learn a skill. And you remember any skills that you've learned? You remember trying to ride a bike and how uncoordinated and shaky everything was at first? You remember learning to drive a car? Right? Oversteering and hitting the brake too hard on all of those things. Right? Because this premotor area is seeking out certain muscles to perform the activity and how much of that activity should be. And over time, all the neurons here connect to certain patterns of muscles. And now, for the future, you don't have to think. If I'm in a car, I don't think about driving with a car anymore. I'm thinking about all the crazies out there that I need to avoid, right? If I steer the corner, if I'm going around a right-hand corner, I'm looking for all the obstacles and things, but my hands and my gas pedal and my brake, all of that just seems to follow a natural pattern, a pattern that is built into this premotor area. You know, if, if you play the piano, you know, you're, if you've done it enough, if you've practiced enough, you could probably do it with your eyes closed. Your fingers can just find the right keys because you know where they are, just, just because your brain knows where they are. You know, I, I can do that. I'm not very good on the piano, but I can do that with a keyboard. And there was a summer when I practiced. It was probably one of the most boring classes you can ever take, learning how to type. And back then, back on Noah's Ark, we had typewriters. There were no keyboards. You know, every mistake you made, you had to white it out. You know, you had to put it in there and retype the key and then type one over it. It took forever to correct stuff. It was just, you know, it was real pain. But, you know, here we are, you know, a little between 7th and 8th grade, taking summer school with Mr. Pewterbaugh. He looked like Mr. Clean, you know, the big, the big six-foot-something bald guy. You know, he was one of the original bald guys, I think. But, you know, he'd just lumber around the room. It's a great big hulking guy, and we're these little junior hires typing on our typewriters, you know, A, S, D, F, J, K, L, semicolon, and, you know, all these little exercises and practice. Today I'm thankful for that because I have places in my premotor area, in my brain, 
for the A key and the F key and the D, you know, and so I can look at something and my fingers just go where they belong. At one point, I sought out and practiced to get neurons in my premotor cortex connected to the right muscles over here so that my fingers would go where they need to go. And that's great. You know, they, they say if you learn how to ride a bicycle, you know, you, you haven't ridden a bicycle for 20 years, but you get on, and in about five seconds of wobbling, boom, then you're going because you've learned it. You, you had some, some learning that took place here, and it's recorded in that premotor cortex, and you're going to have it forever. And likewise with, with all these skills. So you're born with a blank slate, but over time, the more and more activities that you learn, the more and more stuff you have, and the more wiring and connections into the, into the neurons that go directly to your muscles. So this, this, is a, this is a very large area because there's so many things that you can learn over a lifetime. <coughs> if some of this gets damaged, we know today that other neurons can work out new pathways and you can regain some of the things that you've lost. If, if, the, you know, if the damage is here. Now, within this, yeah, go ahead, Lori. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know for sure. I don't know the answer to that exactly, but I know you've got, you know, like billions of neurons here. So you've got, you've got plenty of what is there. You know, we can learn over a lifetime. We used to think, you know, you sort of started slowing down as you got older and stuff. We know that even elderly people can continue to learn, can continue to keep this area functional. All of this stuff, you know, we, we, we've got to get past this whole idea that everything is kind of downhill after a certain age. You know, you, yeah, you use it or you lose it. That's really what it comes down to. Most people are losing it because they're not using it. You know, I... My mom's sister lived to 102. She drove her car till she was 95. You know, she, she was out there just going for it, you know, reading books, going to, you know, going to church and going out with her friends. And, I mean, she just kept making friends and walking and driving, and she just kept doing. You know, she kept at it, and, and she lived a great full life. You know, you don't have to... Just wind down at some certain age. You know? So, anyway, the brain is remarkably agile uh, and even capable of repairing itself if, if there's damage. Takes, takes a lot of extra work. When you think how long it might have taken for you to learn how to walk, months and months and months of practice, you know, sometimes we're, we're loath to practice that much after we get to be adults on something. It's a lot easier to just let it go. But we know that the brain can fix itself in, in many ways. So this premotor area is kind of a fascinating area. You know, you now when I want to turn right in my car, my, my thinking part of my mind just needs to go to the certain area there that's the right-hand turn, and it just presses a button there, and all of a sudden I'm just automatically doing the right-hand turn or the left-hand turn or whatever it is. So I'm, I'm wired to these skills. Now, within this premotor area, there is this other area right here, which we call the motor speech area. And this is controlling the muscles that are a part of my ability to speak or to communicate. Motor speech area. <coughs> and as you might imagine, there are, of course, neurons in this area that are wired right over into the muscles that have something to do with your ability to speak. The contraction of your, your uh, thoracic muscles, of your, uh, you know, the compressing muscles of your abdomen, uh, wired over into your lips, your tongue, your teeth, the muscles in your larynx, and all of those things are controlled from here. We think about this area, we think this is what coordinates the muscles to create your speech sounds. One of the more interesting things here is there does seem to be a certain window of time in most people 
to learn certain sounds that are part of language. And so somewhere in elementary school, somewhere in those elementary school years, your brain basically locks in all of the sounds that your speech makes, at least the sounds that you've heard. Um, and then it's very hard sometimes if you learn a different language that has other sounds in it. Um, if, you, if you try and pick up a language that has sounds in it that you didn't learn to make early on, sometimes it's very difficult to learn to make those specific kinds of sounds if you want to speak another language. Now, there are always a few exceptions. There are some people that can learn languages later in life and, and do fine with it. But for most of us, it's, it's a process. So the more you can expose kids to more languages and other kinds of sounds for them to make, uh, the, the more likely it is that if they pick up another language later in life that they can speak it like a native. But it, it can be difficult because certain ways to move, you know, coordinate your muscles to make certain sounds that are very difficult. Um, I know when... Um, my, my wife's uh, parents grew up in World War II uh, or grew up in Europe during World War II time. And, uh, you know, there were ways that through use of speech that people could tell if somebody was like a spy or somebody came in from outside to spy on them because if they came from another country, like if they came from Germany and they were going to come and try and speak like a native over here, there were probably certain sounds in that language that they couldn't make. And so you'd always turn the conversation around to certain kinds of words to see if the person that you were talking to could say those sounds in your language. If they couldn't, then that person was at least suspect as being somebody that might be a sympathizer or somebody coming from another country that might be wanting to do you harm rather than good. So... And there was so much movement and migration because of the disruption of war, you, you were, couldn't always be sure who was who. So your ability to speak is here. Also um, here is sort of the thoughtful part of language, your ability to um, use the rules of your language, what we call grammar. You know, most students you say grammar to and they go, you know, um, and, and grammar is nothing more than rules. Every language has rules. And if you don't follow the rules of the language, then you sound funny. You know, like uh, a simple rule would be in English, we typically put our adjectives before our nouns. I would say the White House, right? And you would take that all in and you'd picture a building that's painted white. If you're speaking Spanish, the proper use of an adjective is to put it after the noun, la casa blanca. If I was speaking to Spanish people and I said la blanca casa, you know, somebody that speaks naturally would just go, I mean, they would understand what I said, but it would sound weird. It would sound funny because that isn't the rule. And every language has that. I took some German when I was in college. In German, they put the verbs first in the sentence. They tell you what's happening first, then they tell you who did it and who it's, what it, who it's happening to. So instead of saying, I'm going to the store, you say, going, I'm to the store. That's the rule. You know, that's, that's the way you use the German language. And, and you can mix words up and... Somebody can still understand you, but it's not going to sound right, and it's not going to flow, um, and it, it's going to just feel very awkward. So in this area, along with that, I've got to sort of put the words in the right way with my thinking processes here. I've got to formulate what I'm going to say in the right way to then get it out through the right combination of muscles. <coughs> So a good deal of, of my language ability is localized in this motor speech area, which is sort of within the, the boundaries of that premotor area. Okay? Okay, so this, this is that active doing, moving the muscles, coordinating, getting these coordinating activities out. 
Now there's a fourth area here, that gold area out in front, that is known as the prefrontal area. The prefrontal area is what you might think of as psychological movement. What things do you do without moving a muscle? Not feeling, okay? Not sensory kinds of things. Huh? Yeah, like, like you might say thinking. Let's just look at a few of these. You know, just generally, how about motivation? Why do you do what you do? Or how about, how about aggression? How aggressive are you as a person? You know, just, just generally your thought, all of those thoughts that you have, not necessarily about what you're feeling, but what you think. Uh, maybe your use of knowledge, planning things out, figuring out how to do things. How assertive are you? Can you say no well, or do you kind of just go with the flow? Right? Your intelligence is here. Not really all that you know, but how you use it. You might be an Einstein in your mind, but if you can't use it, what good is it? Right? You might be brilliant, but if you can't get it out, if it can't come out in some productive way, then what good is it? So this, this prefrontal area is your decision-making, your planning, Really, this is, this is an awful lot of your personality, right? How do I know what your personality is? By how you behave, right? If you couldn't move a muscle, I would know nothing about you, right? You could live within your mind here. You could be like, we think you're in a coma, but you could be living out a full thought life in your mind. If you couldn't move a muscle, I would know nothing about you. So all of the expression of who you are, right, is being dictated from this area up here. We think of this as intelligence because this is how you use what you know. An awful lot of education here is trying to help you to not just learn things, but express things. You know, I get all sorts of students that will tell me they know this, that, and the other, but if you can't communicate it to me, what good is it? If you can't answer a question on a test, so what? Oh, I know it, but why can't you tell somebody that then? So writing and, and speech, these are all important classes, part of college education. You have to take a speech class. You have to take English classes. You have to learn how to write. Um, you have to learn how to express what it is that you know to benefit other people as well. Now, Lori? Yes, yes, this, um, and, and that really just segues to that. This is, this is that area for decisions and personality. And have you heard of a frontal lobotomy? Maybe you've heard of that before. Um, there's some real good information you can find online. Um, a lobotomy basically takes uh, an instrument and puts it up into the prefrontal area and I was kind of grossed out by this. Basically, it was, uh, you know, they had like a little gun type. The first one was just a hammer, and almost like a hammer and a nail. And just hammering it right up through the bones right here, through the bone right here. You know, just hammer something right up into that prefrontal area, wiggle it around, and just scramble this area right here. And basically, what you lose is all of your decision-making ability. Uh, you would do, this was before we had all the drugs that we have today to deal with mental illness. And this was done basically on people that were violent, that were either a danger to themselves or a danger to others. And in, in a very, what would be a very simple procedure with just a simple local anesthetic, you could just sort of erase a person's violent tendencies. You could erase that, that part of them. Now, you, you erased a whole lot of their personality, too. What you didn't damage was their ability to do what they know how to do. They'd probably have a hard time learning anything from now on, 
But everything that they learned through their lifetime, if you didn't damage this or if you just damaged here, then you'd have all your skills intact. Basically, the person becomes very suggestible. Come on, Mr. Jones, let's go over here. Okay. Would you sit down here? Sure. Right? And just, here, let's eat dinner now. Okay. I can eat, you know, all those things that I've learned how to do, I can do. But I'm not just going to decide to hit you in the face or, you know, take a knife to you or, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm not going to be disruptive and impulsive and violent and aggressive and all of those things. I've just basically erased that. I've disrupted all of those connections out there in front. Um, this, you sort of saw this. Anybody see One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? See that movie years ago? Okay, a few of us, right? Um, basically, it was Jack Nicholson, basically, is a mental patient in there. And he's just sort of a difficult kind of guy. You know, you, he's, he didn't look quite as crazy as some of the other people walking around the institution. But he's just a pain in the rear end. And so you, you get this picture at the end that they've sort of lobotomized him. You know, and, and that would have been one of the more difficult things about this. You know, it, it was basically the only thing you could do to quiet people that were just truly a real danger to others and themselves. It's one of those sort of last resorts. But do you, do you do this sort of to make life easier for the mental workers? You know, do you take that person that is just the pain in the rear end and makes your job twice as hard as what it should be and do you take care of them just to make your life easier? You know, hopefully not. Undoubtedly, it could have happened at some point. They, they couldn't function in a way that they could really make decisions in their own life. They would be like a little child that you would have to suggest everything that they're going to do and kind of lead them into doing everything. So this, this, was, this was practice back before, again, you know, when we talked about other mental kinds of things, putting people in mental institutions, this was before all of our advances in chemistry and, and biology, anatomy, physiology that have led us to drugs that can treat these kinds of problems in other ways. So this, this prefrontal area is kind of like if you wanted to pick one place in the human brain that is really who you are as a human being, as a person, it's right here in this prefrontal area. The prefrontal area uses all the other parts and integrates all the other parts of the brain to be who you are. Okay? All right, so that's the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is this, this uh, movement part. Okay, the other lobes focus on sensory interpretation. When I think of the cerebrum here, I always think this way. I think of the frontal lobe as the doing part of the brain, right? And all the other lobes over here are the being parts of the brain, okay? All of these lobes over here are kind of who I am, at least in terms of all the experiences that I have over time are all recorded over here. So this frontal lobe is going to use all of this and express. This is going to use and express all that I am, all that I've experienced, all that I know. So when you look at these, these other lobes of the cerebrum, think of them like this, like... Um, We've got the parietal lobe. Let's, let's see. We've got, let's remind ourselves. We've got the parietal lobe here. We've got the occipital lobe, right? And we have the temporal lobe. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay. <clears throat> let's, let's take these three lobes then and look at what's going on there. The parietal lobe. Let's start here. This interprets your skin. Okay, I have sensory data coming from the skin of my human body, and I've got lots of it. It's the largest organ in my human body. So I've got um, 
data coming from my skin and it comes into the parietal lobe. Now, what part of the parietal lobe? It comes into this location that we call the primary somatic sensory cortex or primary somatic sensory area. Soma is a word that just means body. So basically what we're saying, this is the sense that is located over my whole body. And that's the data that comes through my skin. Temperature, touch, pressure, pain. You know, I want to know if something's attacking my human body. So I've got sensory receptors all over my skin to let me know if damage is occurring. You and I don't like pain much, do we? Have you ever been thankful for your pain? You should be thankful for your pain. What happens to somebody that doesn't feel pain anymore? Yeah, they get injured big time. You know, you've probably heard of, of children that have been born where they just don't somehow process pain. And they break legs and they, they just do all sorts of things. This is, if you've ever heard of the disease leprosy, this is basically what happens in leprosy. Leprosy attacks the nerve endings here and you don't feel things. And so you start wearing through surfaces of your skin. And things start falling apart because you just overuse them. Instead, you know, if you rub something too much, you're going to get stimulation back that tells you, stop doing that. That hurts. If you can't feel it hurts, you can just keep doing something until you wear your skin right away. Any number of things. So, pain is actually something to be thankful for in reality. Now, all of your skin is wired right back into here. Okay, do you remember the picture of this area here, right? The primary motor cortex. Well, right across the central sulcus, what's, the, what's this feature right here? Post-central gyrus. So this primary somatic sensory area is also the post-central gyrus. And guess what? All of the skin of my human body is wired in the same way the muscles are wired in. The skin is wired in, and I've got certain neurons here that are receiving data from certain pieces of skin, and you can see all of it wired in to, the, to certain places. So how do I know if I'm scratching the palm of my hand and not my belly button, right? Well, the, the wiring from my belly button goes over here, and the wiring from my hand goes over here. So depending upon which nerves are stimulated, I know where that's coming from. Okay, so the exact same way that the muscles are wired, right across the, the valley, all of the skin from my human body is wired in. So the data is interpreted here to be what it is, but I still don't necessarily know what that is. So there's sort of a step two that needs to take place. I get the data, it feels painful, it feels like it's coming from this area, Okay, the next thing is, what is it? And association is the means of interpreting what you sense. And so what do you see right here? With this primary area, there's what we call the somatic sensory association area, all of this light blue space here. And this is basically an area where you record sensations of your lifetime and when something new comes in through the skin how do you know what it is? What do you do? You associate it with something that's already happened, right? You say, okay, here's, here's what's happening and what is that that's happening? Well, that's, right? You associate it with something else. It's a little bit like this. Let's imagine that I bring, um, I've been to the Caribbean and I bring back a fruit that you've never seen or tasted before. And we cut out a little piece and I give you a piece, okay? And I say, what do you think of that? And you say, oh, good or sweet or, I say, no, what, what do you think of that? And really you're saying that tastes like a 
a mango or a strawberry or, or a whatever, right? What you've done is just associated this brand new thing with something that you know, don't you? And that's what you do throughout your sensory experience. You get the raw data in, you figure out exactly what kind of data it is, but then you've got to come over here and say, okay, what is that like? What in my common experience is that like? And you begin to learn new things by associating them with things that you already know. Now, what does this say about education? The more you know, the more you can learn, right? The person with very little experience, you know, the person that has never been out much in the world and really has not experienced much is going to be able to learn very little. But the more and more you learn, the more and more you're capable of learning. The more you have to judge new experiences by, the more capable you are to learn new things. That's really what education is about, trying to give you more and more and more so that you're capable of learning more and more. <coughs> So the, the process of using your senses is the process of receiving and interpreting the data and then associating it with past experience. You know, they say don't judge somebody till you've walked a mile in their shoes. And that is part of it. You know, you've got, all of us have our own set of experiences that we learn and base all of our new learning on. You know, as an instructor, I'm always trying to find things in our common experience that we've, all, that we've all experienced. And I'm trying to teach you new things that you can relate to. Like if I'm talking about blood flow like freeways, you know, like traffic or nerve impulses can be related to, to traffic on a freeway. We all understand about moving things along roads. So the more you can take things that you already know and apply them to new things, the more you can learn. <clears throat> so so this, this whole skin of your body has this primary and this associative areas. Right? Now, I want to really highlight then this whole concept. You want to really focus on this concept of association because you're going to see it over and over throughout here. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the one other area that's in this somatic sensory area is a, a location called the gustatory area. You see this little circle of tissue right here. This is your sense of taste, okay, which is apparently then uh, just sort of an alteration in your ability to use the sensations through your skin. These are chemical senses. Your sense of taste is not what most people mean when they say taste. If I say that tastes really good, I'm usually not talking about my sense of taste. Sense of taste can only sense four things, right? Whether something is sweet, salt, sour, or bitter. And sort of the sour and bitter, sometimes the bad things that you put in your mouth are sour or bitter. Um, we can alter that over a lifetime. There's certain bitter flavors that people like and certain sour flavors that they like, but often things that are not good for you are sour or bitter. Good things for you are salty or sweet. And so we sort of generally just judge a basic chemical components of something with our sense of taste. When we talk about, oh, that tastes good, we're usually talking about flavor, which is really an olfactory sense, your sense of smell, right? You know, when you have a cold... You know, most of the stuff you eat tastes like cardboard. You can still sense salt, sweet, sour, and bitter, okay, but you don't get all that flavor that really comes through your, your sense of smell. So your sense of taste is here too. You should be able to localize that area. So that's, um, that's the parietal lobe. And what you want to see now that the other areas here, um, the other lobes all have primary and association areas for other senses. Okay, this occipital lobe has a primary and an association area. 
This temporal lobe has a primary and an association area. Okay? If we look at the occipital lobe here, the uh, primary visual cortex, which is this bright yellow area, all the way, the extreme posterior part of your brain, this is the place where you see. You do not see with your eyes. Your brain, in a very interesting thing, projects back into your eyes. It makes you think with your brain that you are seeing with your eyes. You really are not. Your eyes are receiving the data. That data means nothing unless it gets to the cerebral cortex. If this area were damaged, your eyes could be working 100%, but you wouldn't be able to see a thing because your ability to see is actually here. Just like when you feel a pinprick here, if you feel pain here on the tip of your finger, there's no pain there. All there is is data traveling a set of axons into a certain area of this somatic sensory area here. And this is interpreting it. If we damage this, you would not feel a thing right here. But your brain does this very interesting thing so that you can fix, so you can go, oh, that's where the damage is. Your brain lets you know where it is. It projects the pain back to that location, right? And then you can go find it and fix it. Take the pin out of your finger or whatever it is, right? People that have lost a limb can still have pain in their fingers. They don't have a hand anymore, but they've still got pain in their fingers because the fingers part of the cortex is still there. And it can still feel things that don't exist. So, in terms of vision, vision is all localized here. This is where you see, but how do you know what you see? Well, you have a visual association area, and that's the area around about this primary area where you figure out, am I looking at the face of my friend or am I looking at the face of an enemy? Is that my daughter or is that my son? Right? I've got visual memories here. I've got visual images that I have labeled, and I take what I see and compare it to the things that I have seen so that I know what it is. Right? Same thing goes on in the auditory area, in the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is where the auditory cortex is. Uh, the primary and association areas here. So everything I hear goes into this part of my temporal lobe. And then we figure out how loud is it, how soft is it, what's, what's the pitch of the sound, is there a repetitive nature to it, like a rhythm in you know, a drum beat or something. Or maybe I'm listening to a, a, a repetitive sound, I can't see it, but I'm listening to it. And, you know, is that a motorcycle or is that somebody working with a jackhammer? You know, it's a da 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 kind of sound. What am I listening to? Well, I don't know what it is unless I've got common experience for that. You're listening to an orchestra and there's a little solo part coming. Is that an oboe? Is that a flute? Is that a clarinet? Is it a bassoon? They all sound somewhat similar, but they've got their own sound qualities to them. And you're not going to know that unless you've listened to each instrument separately and you know what kind of a sound it makes. That experience is recorded here, and then the new things that you hear that come in here, you go out seeking, what does that sound like? And you identify those things in your world due to those. <coughs> so all of these, these lobes here are dedicated to taking in and interpreting the things that are coming in through your senses. Um, there is a speech area here as well. There's an area called Wernicke's area. And it's the area that we think of as sensory speech. This is when you hear something or you read something. What do the words mean? Right, And this is where you sort of take it apart and figure it out. This is, this is a recording of all that you've learned. You can't really formulate something new. You can have all the rules and you can have all the muscles, 
But if you don't have the basic raw information, you can't figure out what to say. Different kinds of aphasia, where people have trouble with language, are localized somewhere between these two. Right? <clears throat> this is understanding and formulating coherent speech. If something is damaged here, you can't recognize, you can see an object, but you can't put a name to it. You can't figure out what it is. It's very difficult to communicate if the words in your head don't have images or objects that they belong to. Right? So this area, right, works with, there's a, there's a whole set of axons that run from here over to here. It's called the arcuate fasciculus. Remember, fasciculus is just a bundle of some kinds of objects, right? And there's this pathway that leads from one directly to the other that controls your speech, right? That comes right over here to this motor speech area, of course. <coughs> now, one of the things you should know about speech, too, is that it's localized to the left side of your brain. You know, almost everything else that we've talked about here, you've got a left side and a right side. You know, all of this frontal lobe. You've got a right side controlling the left side of your body, left side controlling the right side of your body. They have telephone cables so the two sides can talk to each other and coordinate each other and make everything work together. But one of the things that is really localized on the left side of your brain is this ability to speak. If you damage these, these same areas on the right side of your brain, you'd still be able to speak fluently. And maybe from psychology, you probably know this, that people are right-brained and left-brained, right? And we know that there's certain kinds of things, like the left side of your brain is the more reasoning part of it. Your mathematics, your skills, your spoken and written language. Language is here because it has rules. Right? There's specific rules in the order of letters you put together to create a word, the sounds that you use. There are rules for which sounds make which words. There are rules for how the words fit together to make sentences. There are all of these logical reasons. This is the logical side of your mind. Okay? You can't operate in the world without a certain amount of logic and reasoning. The right side of your brain um, has things like spatial perception, sort of a holistic thing, insight, imagination, musical ability. Um, this is sort of the more feeling part of your mind. <coughs> I might write an essay with the left side of my brain. I'll probably write poetry with the right side of my brain. I can... I can play the piano, I can follow the notes on a sheet of, of paper with the left side of my brain. If I want to create a concert, if I want to do something creative, if I want to write music, I'm going to use the right side of my brain. I'm going to have to follow the rules with the left side, but all of the different creative sorts of things are going to come out through perception and insight and combination of different things. So... We have these two hemispheres, and we know where all of these various functional areas are, but some of them are localized to one side of your brain or the other. Okay? So how are we doing? Are we, are we good with that? Got the basic ideas here? Okay.